with us here, former U.S. attorney, now law professor at the University of Alabama. Also joining us, my friend, the former RNC chairman, Michael Steele, is here. And with us at the table, New York Times Washington correspondent, Mike Schmidt, is here. He is byline on that Times reporting we just read from all MSNBC contributors. Mike Schmidt, take me through the reporting. And we pulled some of the examples that you um, named. Let me play those for you of, of Liz Cheney starting to really hew from the criminal code. Did Donald Trump, through action or inaction, corruptly seek to obstruct or impede Congress's official proceedings to count electoral votes? He could have told them to go home, uh, and he failed to do so. Uh, it's hard to imagine a more significant and more serious dereliction of duty uh, than that. Is his failure to make that statement criminal negligence? You know, uh, I think that, that there are a number of, as the chairman said, uh, potential criminal statutes uh, at issue here. So for a president to, through either his action or his inaction, for example, um, attempt to impede or obstruct the counting of electoral votes, which is an official proceeding of Congress, um, is, you know, we, the, the committee is looking at that, looking at whether uh, what he did um, constitutes uh, that kind of a crime. It's absolutely clear that um, what President Trump uh, was doing, uh, what, what a number of people around him were doing, that they knew it was unlawful. Mike, from your reporting, it's clear that this is significant in terms of the history of congressional investigations. But it also, um, and we may never really see into this completely, but it has clearly uh, lit a fire under the Justice Department. I think that to understand why the committee did this and the effectiveness that it's had, we have to remember the other investigations of Donald Trump. He was impeached twice, never convicted, and obviously removed from office. The Mueller investigation, which looked at whether he broke the law, did not even make a decision about whether he actually broke the law. These investigations failed to stop Trump. He was unbound, unbridled, and continued on to do essentially what, what he wanted. So when this committee is formed, it took a different perspective and a different approach. It was staffed differently. They put a former U.S. attorney, Tim Hafey, in charge of the day-to-day -day work of the investigation. And starting from that time where Liz Cheney read from the criminal code, they approached the public like a jury at a criminal trial. Mm -hmm. And they spoke to them like they were trying to build the criminal elements. Most congressional investigations are about revealing new facts and providing recommendations on whether new legislation should be there. This committee's public posture has been criminality, criminality, criminality. How can we show this? How can we educate the public about it? And up until the middle of the summer, we didn't really know that the Justice Department was actually doing anything and actually investigating this. So whether the Justice Department would have gotten there or not without the committee, certainly the perception exists that the committee is the one that pushed the Justice Department and Merrick Garland there. The assistance that the committee had in this effort um, seems to also include a, a federal judge who said this, um, and this was around litigation, I think for John Eastman's records. Um, judge David Carter ruled in an extraordinary ruling that, quote, the illegality of the plan was obvious. Our nation was founded on the peaceful transition of power, epitomized by George Washington laying down his sword to make way for democratic elections. Ignoring this history, President Trump vigorously campaigned for the vice president to single-handedly determine the results of the 2020 election. Based on the evidence, the court finds it more likely than not that President Trump corruptly attempted to obstruct the joint session of Congress on January 6, 2021. What was the impact of a federal judge basically corroborating Liz Cheney's citation and saying, I've looked at some of the evidence and it's abundantly clear he committed that crime? So what the committee did is that it built different arguments and built to use building blocks to make the larger point about criminality. And in one of its more unusual moves, it went to federal court earlier this year and essentially filed what I call the de facto indictment of Trump and Eastman in this fight in a court in California in federal court about whether they could get certain documents from Eastman. 
And they basically laid out the criminality as if they were laying out an indictment, but it was in this civil matter. And then the judge agreed with them. The judge said it was more likely than not that someone had broken the law, the law that, that the law had been broken. And that gave the committee even more. It, so the, it wasn't just the committee saying, oh, I think there's criminality here. It allowed them to say a federal judge agrees with or, or, or close enough agrees with our assessment. And they continued to beat the drum more and more aggressively in public on that in the in the media they did. And then by the time that they get to the hearings over the summer, they are are lining these hearings up. And as I was saying before, like a criminal trial and speaking to the public like it's a jury and trying to build build these cases like they're criminal cases, even though they have no power criminally whatsoever. They can make referrals to the Justice Department, but beyond that, all they can do is try and move public support. But they focus the public's attention on criminality, and it certainly looks like they focus the Justice Department on it as well. You know, Michael Steele, um, they've also turned Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy into complicit actors. I mean, what, what mm -hmm. comes through loud and clear is that all this went on very much, um, if not in public view, w w with a nod and a wink and the help of at least 19 Republican members of Congress. And I wonder if, if you look at the committee's work, if you look at the, the, the pile and, and really the, the final public hearing was the culmination of these three towers of evidence that they sought to build. One, that he knew he lost. It was featured in the very first one. They came back to it at the end. Two, that he knew the things he was saying were, in Bill Barr's words, BS, that all these conspiracy theories had, in my view, inappropriately been investigated by DOJ, and, and they came back and said, not true. And three, that he was well aware of the violence and wanted to be there for it. Yeah, I, I think all of that very uh, accurately is laid out by the committee. I, I think, you know, to, to Michael's uh, fine reporting, um, it is very clear from the very beginning what the emphasis by this committee would be, given the limitations on its power. It had to convince two audiences. One was the Justice Department, the other was the American people. And at any given moment in time throughout the course of the summer, uh, one or the other was the priority of that particular hearing whether it was from the very beginning where they wanted to bring the American people to this narrative uh, in a way that they would want to sit back at the beginning of summer in their comfy uh, summer chairs with a drink in their hand and follow along, or more compelling moments where they would bring witnesses out who were in the room where it happened, who had ear on the ground to know what was uh taking place to to lay out the evidentiary part of this uh, as they saw it and as they were gathering it for the Justice Department. Very adeptly done. Uh, and I think we're going to see as this comes to its conclusion with the final report, if not maybe perhaps one more hearing, who knows, mm -hmm. um, that, um, that this committee's work is not done. And what's going to be important, I think, for everyone to understand, and again, it kind of, it's sort of a thread in, in, in Mike's, uh, Michael's reporting, that this committee, yeah, we stand down because there'll be a change in Congress, but we want to lay this thing out in such a way in, in, that we don't go away, that the work doesn't get dismissed and, and disappears. And I think that's going to be a very, very important element after the election. Uh, for the country to understand that, yeah, the committee may disappear with a Republican majority in January, but that's your choice to make now in November. But even if you choose to have this committee go away, its work will go on. And that's where the Justice Department will pick up. That's where we see a lot of this evidence also play itself out in places like Georgia and New York. And, and I know this is a point in the program. We say that the Republican takeover is not a foregone conclusion. Um, Michael Steele, I want to I want to come back to you with one more piece of evidence that even even in the committee's telling was a turning point. This was the only a lot of the public hearings were moved, but none of them were sprung on us. None of them were dramatically and suddenly oh. added, except the testimony of Cassidy Hutchinson. Um, this also r reportedly um, caught a lot of attention and uh, was compelling even to the Justice Department, which we, we can talk about whether that's good or bad after. But let me let me show you some of Cassidy Hutchinson's dramatic mm -hmm. testimony. <laughs> 